Good morning again and welcome back to the convocation and this is the ninth year that I've presided over this uh, special event since Lisa and I returned to Charlotte in 2005. Uh, and I'm happy to report that notwithstanding some daunting challenges, many of which Joan outlined, uh, we think this institution's on a roll. Let me go off script just for a moment though to acknowledge uh, the partnership that I've had with Lisa in being here the last nine years. Those of you who have been at Bissell House have often seen her work, but she also works in a volunteer capacity in the Charlotte community representing the university. And she's also taken on the task with Jean Johnson, president of our foundation, of raising the first money for the drumline that will lead to the marching band in 2015. And I should say, I hope she can hear me because she's been around to the drums a lot lately. <laughs> but thank you, Lisa, for all you've done. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who are new to UNC Charlotte, you can also find a wealth of information about the university in what's called the Chancellor's uh, Outbox, which is on our website. And uh, if you've had just enough of all the boring information that is available on television, Netflix, Facebook, Google, and Twitter, you can also consult the Outbox and find past videos of me giving this speech over the last eight years. <laughs> and while you're doing, doing that, consider the sorry state of your life that you would <laughs> turn to watch Phil Dubois for entertainment. Um, I won't spend too much time this morning, but I do have a bit to say, and uh, as we've actually accomplished so much, I want to acknowledge where those accomplishments have been. My mother used to say that a uh, pat on the back is a lot better than a kick in the rear, so we're going to start high and work our way down. Um, <laughs> Enrollment at the university, as Joan suggested, continues to grow. The last fall enrollment was 26,232. That was an all-time high, and we could very well top that this year when all the numbers are in. That growth puts us in third place in the number of undergraduates on any campus, uh, and again, we could very well top that uh, as well. We've seen very impressive increases in the numbers of uh, completed applications from both prospective freshmen uh, and transfers. Indeed, among freshmen, completed applications have increased 64 percent since 2005, uh, and the academic qualifications of the students that we have admitted and who have enrolled continues to improve. Um, our freshman class this year will have a weighted GPA average of 3.8. Now, as we've weathered through the econom economic recession, we've had to address the, the, the painful reality that we've had to teach these many more students with fewer resources. And there's no question that this reality has made us more efficient. We're spending 8.2% per degree produced uh, in 2011-12 than we did five years previously. And during the same time, we've produced, increased our production of degrees by 18% through 2011-12, and by 24% if we include last year. Uh, no one needs to lecture the faculty and staff at UNC Charlotte about doing more with less We've been there. We've done that. Uh, indeed, continuing our enrollment growth, improved retention, and increased degree production, it is probable that we will be adding a third commencement ceremony in May. Now, as the, uh, but you're all excited about that. Um, <laughs> as the economy begins to regain some of its strength, but while state resources for higher education remains constrained, I thought this past year would be a good time to take a look at our long-range enrollment plan. That judgment was rewarded by the Board of Governors in February uh, when they set a goal of increasing the percentage of uh, state residents with a bachelor's degree uh, from the current level of 26 percent to the level of 32 percent by 2018 and to 37 percent by 2025. That would make North Carolina a top 10 state in baccalaureate degree completion. For the Board of Governors and the state of North Carolina, however, to achieve that level of college attainment it is impossible to imagine any growth scenario that would not include UNC Charlotte in a very significant way. So this past spring, we asked our Associate Provost for Enrollment Management, uh, Tina McIntyre, to lead a task force to assess future demand for education at UNC Charlotte at the undergraduate level as a first step to understanding total future demand. Some of you will remember we did this back in 2006 when the Provost led an exercise that said, we, we think we will grow to 35,000 students by the year 2020. But as the recession took hold, we had to modify that rate of growth 
what the McIntyre group has told us recently is that is there's little we can do to stem the growing demand for higher education in this region. Projections are always just projections, of course, but if you look at the data, the pattern of increasing numbers of completed applications, estimates of high school graduation rates, increasing enrollments in the community colleges, and population growth in the, in the region that is Charlotte and in the state of North Carolina, it means that the original estimate of a university enrollment of at least 35,000 is still quite reasonable. What is not reasonable is to attempt to maintain the pace of enrollment growth that we've had in the past without adequate resources. Although it is true that the General Assembly this year uh, allocated about $6.9 million in additional funding for enrollment growth, the budget cuts amount to $6.6 .6 million, including legislatively imposed budget uh, cuts to uh, increasing academic and operational efficiencies and some additional reductions for all of the campuses to fund the general administration and the Board of Governors strategic initiatives, which is a new plan at that level. What helps us deal with all these new students, of course, is that all students pay tuition. And now that's the source of approximately 40 cents of every dollar that we spend in instruction and academic support. So you can do the math. Uh, if we're to preserve access for all of these qualified students sending completed applications to, to us while maintaining the quality of our academic and administrative support, we have to strike a balance. Moreover, as we uh, go forward, we, as Joan said, we need to be mindful not only, uh, only of the students coming through the door, but also those walking across the stage to receive their degrees. Funding decisions with the UNC system are gradually shifting away from purely enroll uh, rewarding enrollment growth to focusing on performance-based systems that track students' timely degree completion uh, and their graduation rates. So beginning with the fall of 2014, uh, we are going to authorize the undergraduate admission office to enroll up to 125 new freshmen each year over the approximately 3,100 and change uh, new freshmen we will have this fall. Um, if that target is reached and we continue it year after year, we will have about a 4% growth rate in our freshman class. But one of the things we will ask uh, our undergraduate admissions folks to do is to maintain the high academic standards for that entering class so we can maximize the chances that those students will get their degrees. Now, of course, we all know that students' academic uh, preparation isn't the only thing that matters in uh, completing a degree, but it is a major factor. At this time, we will maintain our enrollments for transfer students, even though demand from that group has increased 60% over the past five years as well. This is not going to diminish our historic commitment to transfer students particularly those coming from the North Carolina Community College system. We began as a two-year institution. You all have remembered Charlotte College, and we have considered our status as the leading transfer institution in the UNC system to be a point of pride in support of our goal of providing an accessible and uh, affordable college education to all qualified students. But we now understand that the ability of transfer students to complete their degrees at the university has a lot to do with whether or not they complete their associate's degree at the community college first. We want to spend some time this year uh, thinking about this, looking at our data, trying to unravel the different categories of transfer students, and of course we want to do that in full collaboration with our community college partners. We see also a major opportunity to strengthen our graduate programs at both the master's and doctoral levels. And we've allocated significant resources for marketing those programs this year, and we've had some good results. I've asked Graduate Dean Tom Reynolds to initiate a graduate enrollment planning process this year so we can identify specific programs where we have opportunity, ability, and capacity to serve additional students at the graduate level. Our goal here to build a major research university cannot happen without significant uh, expansion in the number, scope, and size of our graduate programs, particularly at the doctoral level. And for that reason, we will maintain our longtime goal of having 25% of our headcount at the graduate level. Tom's work will also include looking at the support structure for graduate students, particularly graduate student financial support. For both undergraduate and graduate recruitment and retention, we're also going to move aggressively this year to address a problem we have come to understand much better than in the past, and that's a broken scholarship administration process. 
The most visible indicator of the problem is that uh, we have not been allocating all of the funding that we've had available for scholarships. And we have a certain number of other scholarships that are unawardable because the donors place such uh, severe restrictions on who could receive the, the award. With the students in need of financial support more than ever, this is not a tolerable situation. It impairs our ability to recruit and retain the very best students we can. It makes, the, uh, makes very poor relationships with donors who have their donated funds not awarded, and it confounds our college and our departmental administrators about the funding available to them to award to our students. So again, under the leadership of Tina McIntyre and a team of very thoughtful staff, we think we have a good understanding of the problem and what it will take to solve it. So accordingly, in this upcoming budget year, I'm going to allocate sufficient funds to support the staffing of a centralized university scholarship office and the acquisition of the ne necessary technology and enterprise support system to make it work. We're going to completely re-engineer that process. And a university scholarship office, I think, will help us improve our ability to be better stewards of the private dollars entrusted to us uh, and to permit us to be more strategic about how we allocate financial resources to student recruitment and retention. As the new students arrive at UNC Charlotte, we want to continue to expand our inventory of academic programs while divesting ourselves of ones that no longer have demand or that have outlived their usefulness. And over the past year, led by the provost and the deans and the department heads, we've added a new bachelor's program in neurodiagnostics and sleep science, several new minors, and of course, we've added new master's programs uh, in health informatics and in real estate. Earlier this year, we received approval for the 20th doctoral program in nurse, that's in nursing practice, and about 10 days ago, the Board of Governors approved the 21st program at the doctoral level in public health sciences, moving us closer to the goal of having the second school of public health in the state of North Carolina. We'll be moving this year also to uh, see new master's degrees approved, one in applied energy and electromechanical systems, that's to reinforce the work of the EPIC uh, team, and a professional science master's in data analytics, excuse me, data science and business analytics, what we're calling DSBA. Both of those uh, we think have high potential for strengthening economic development and job creation in the region. We'll also move forward to develop a proposal for our 22nd doctoral program, a PhD in research measurement and uh, evaluation, uh, largely located within the College of Education, uh, using some existing coursework. We think that's not going to be a, a high cost program, but it will be a high demand one. While, we, uh, while the faculty and staff have been working hard to deliver those programs and to teach and advise all of these students, their productive research and creative activities are just continuing to amaze everyone. From the research work of Professor Kim Jones in the College of Arts and Architecture, to reanimate an original dance composed by Martha Graham, uh, to the formation of two new additional university industry cooperative research centers, now bringing our total to six, our faculty members continue to, continue to move the leading edge of scholarship and uh, creative activity uh, with dozens of published books and peer-reviewed articles and abstracts. Our research funded by the government and by industry sources reached levels last seen in 2009 this past year. Our faculty were also awarded 16 patents, and we licensed 19 uh, intellectual agreements to industry to move our research uh, into the marketplace of ideas uh, and inventions. Uh, work led by Vice Chancellor for Research and Economic Development, Bob Wilhelm, and our Venture Prize Director, Paul Wettenhall, continued to provide important support for entrepreneurs and in incubating uh, small businesses. And looking ahead this year, we will move ahead with the strategic plan for research growth that was developed by Bob Wilhelm in consultation with the academic deans and many faculty groups. Uh, that plan is designed, among other things, to move us closer to the goal of having UNC Charlotte have sustainable external research funding of $50 million annually by the year 2020. And there are a lot of additional initiatives associated with that. One of the things we will do this year is I will also make a major investment in our big data um, uh, program, data science and business analytics. Uh, even though we didn't get the state funding that we had hoped for it, uh, we think there are just um, unusually productive industry partnerships out there that can be brought to uh, fruition if we'll make some investments right now. And we'll also continue the work of Bob's team 
you know, on the Advancing University Research Administration project called Aura to improve our research administration processes and procedures. Now, with the growth of the campus enrollment, of course, we've had and our academic programs and all of this research, we've had a lot of new building. And I don't need to uh, make a complete list of it, but I'll just note the highlights. Uh, this week, we opened two new residence hall, one in the South Village called Hunt Hall, replacing Hunt Village, one in the North Village called Belk Hall. Uh, we have a new dining and student community uh, complex in South Village under construction. And if you haven't seen that part of campus, and many of you would never have a reason to because there was no easy entry into it. You'd have to go down what was called High Rise Road. We now have a road that leads into the South Village called Alumni Way, uh, and it will allow you to circumnavigate the campus without ever having to leave it, uh, and it also makes for a great uh, trail. The completion of Alumni Way allowed us to install our fifth stoplight. Woohoo! Um, <laughs> And uh, we also renovated Heck and Bleichner Lake after it, after it threatened to break and flood. And I'm looking forward to the Chancellor's Catch and Release Fishing Derby uh, after we get that, plant, that uh, lake stocked. So bring your children. Uh, on the far west side of campus, the uh, University Research, Re Research Partnership Building Portal should be open in February. Uh, and many of the older campus buildings this year will continue to get renewed attention. Uh, and renovation. Last year we had seven classrooms in the Denny complex that we worked on. Uh, we're also in the process of designing a collaborative learning classroom that is going to be housed in Kennedy. Uh, we did a lot of work in Atkins Library last year in the lower level for the students. If you've never been in there, just go in through the uh, Ritazes at the lower level of the library and see what the students are doing. Uh, you could even join them. They, they wouldn't know you're there. Um, uh, we did renovations last year in Friday, Rowe, Storrs, uh, and Robinson, uh, providing support for a number of colleges. This year, we're going to be working on departmental space in the Smith Building, uh, and also we've got some planning underway to uh, the Belk Gym, which will affect, we hope positively, the space for the Department of Kinesiology. We're also working in the Belk College to create their uh, business, um, their student center for professional development. Uh, that is in the Friday building, and we're working in the Calvert building to create a consolidated university center for academic excellence, multicultural academic services, and the undergraduate advising center. Uh, what I will say to the faculty members in the older parts of campus, uh, we feel your pain. We understand that your buildings don't look maybe as modern and new as the ones that have been put up lately. Uh, but we're fully committed to making sure that we renovate those older spaces and make them just as functional and useful as any space we have on campus. Uh, we're also upgrading some uh, high-performance computing labs, and we're doing some work in Burson. Burson is the focus of a study to see what we can do with Burson uh, until we get a new science building. We've had a $120 million request into general administration and the Board of Governors and the General Assembly for several years. What you need to know, of course, is that the General Assembly hasn't funded any new capital construction in the system for several years, and there are only a couple of projects in the planning phase. We need to get that advanced, and we're going to work hard to do it. But in the interim, Burson needs some attention, and we will take a look at that study and see what we can do for the money we have available. Uh, in terms of our fundamental DNA, moving beyond bricks and mortar, the fundamental DNA of our faculty and staff, that's their physical energy and, and their uh, mental capacities. Uh, it seems that the general c condition of our faculty and staff, I think, uh, is terrific. You remain engaged, committed, and collaborative uh, to this academic community. And as we have filled new positions for one reason or another, and Joan mentioned we filled about 90 positions this year in the faculty, we've been able to recruit excellent people with lots of energy and enthusiasm and new ideas. As the economic recovery has taken hold, we're seeing increasing ra raids, however, on our talent pool by other institutions and by the, in uh, the private sector. That's why it was especially disappointing to see the uh, General Assembly this year not approve any salary increases for this upcoming biennium, although it is certainly possible that something in this area may be done in the 2014 legislative session if economic uh, conditions continue to improve. Uh, what this means, of course, is that most of our classified staff, SPA staff, have only seen one legislatively authorized raise in five years, and that was the modest 1.2% increase we had in 2012. 
our EPA non-faculty and uh, our faculty employees have been placed in much the same position with just a 3% average raise in 2012, and, and that's the only raise in the last five years. Obviously, our employees have been very patient, uh, but we do need increases if we're going to maintain morale and to minimize uh, departures from our institution. With that said, I do think we've done a pretty good job, particularly in terms of our SPA employees. Over the last several years, in four strategic salary initiatives, we've reallocated $4.3 million uh, over the last five years to make sure that most of our SPA uh, employees were teaching at least at the minimum of their approved bandwidth um, and um, were being paid market-based salaries. Currently, 83% of our SPA staff are being paid at or above their respective market reference rates. Uh, we'd like to do better, but we also know of no other campus in the system that has done that well by the SPA employees. Uh, we still have issues with respect to our non-faculty EPA employees. Although we made some progress on their salaries in the last salary cycle, but where we have a particularly compelling need right now is the adequacy of salaries for our faculty, full-time faculty, who were hired many years ago and who have been in their current rank since the worst years of the recession. Our current faculty salaries compare well to the average salaries paid in other doctoral granting institutions, and even they compare well to our Board of Governors peers. But our long-term goal, and one which was approved by the Board of Governors several years ago, is to ensure that we're able to hire the best talent and to keep them and fend off competitors. And to do that, we have to have our salaries at or above the 80th percentile of average salaries in doctoral granting institutions. We have a deficiency against that benchmark, and we have some colleges significantly below it. So working with the provost, with the deans, and with the department heads, and this will be a topic for our conversation with the department heads this afternoon, we're, we're gonna fund some kind of strategic salary initiative this year for the faculty to address issues related to salary compression, equity, and retention. Now, as we take on this issue, it's important to recognize that the most recent legislative session resulted in limitations with respect to salary administration, and as a result, we are prohibited from increasing salaries simply to reward merit, God forbid, uh, or to address market changes. But the legislature did authorize us to address equity and retention issues, and we intend to do that. We will also complete a salary study this year for our EPA non-faculty salaries, so we understand that issue a little more clearly. And the provost and I agree that as a matter of fairness, we need to address the very low salaries paid our part-time employees, the vast majority of whom work in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. And so we hope that next year, with the budget, we may be able to address those needs. Over time, of course, we hope that the state economy improves uh, sufficiently and our political case strengthens to restore regular salary increases and capital appropriations as part of the university's budget. And although the president and the general administration manage our political relationships, we think we're doing our part to build a broad base of support in this region by engaging the business community, alumni, and friends in recognizing and in recognizing the importance of UNC Charlotte in this region. Led by my special assistant for constituent relations, Betty Doster, our program of visiting with community leaders, media, alumni, and elected officials this past year, those have been very successful. We'll continue that this year with visits to Iredell and Stanley counties and in an expanded set of visitations within Mecklenburg County. It's nearly impossible to measure the impact of this work among our constituents outside, but we do have some sense that we're, we're uh, getting some traction. Uh, and this includes hard work by Steve Ward and his colleagues in communications. This year, our own Urban Institute did its annual survey of Mecklenburg County residents, and they were, uh, citizens were asked to rate UNC Charlotte on a scale from excellent to poor in terms of how much value we brought to the community. In that survey, over 50% of the respondents said that UNC Charlotte's value to the community was excellent, and another 20% added very good. And in fact, the percentage of excellent had jumped 20% over the last year. I don't know if it's sampling error, but I'll take it. Um, 
we're going to see how that goes, but I think it's a good positive trend as we've seen gradual rises in the excellence and very goods over several years. We were also honored over the past 18 months with some important community awards, including the Creative Thinkers Award from the Carolinas chapter of the Commission Counselors on Real Estate for the creation of the Center City Building. The campus was honored with a Cornerstone Award from the Charlotte Region Commercial Board of Realtors for the positive community uh, economic impact of our building program and light rail. And we were honored with the Energy Leadership Award of the Charlotte Business Journal for our EPIC initiative. Charlotte seems to have noticed that we're here and it's not all about football. A lot of it goes to the very hard work that you're doing each and every day. Now along with building political support, we're building financial support from the private sector and our alumni. Our overall private fundraising this year reached an all-time high of $30.6 million. An all-time record including major gifts from Belk Incorporated of $5 million and Mr. Jerry Richardson with 10. We intend to use this coming year to position the university to launch our first comprehensive campaign of private fundraising since the It Takes a Gift campaign closed at the end of Chancellor Woodward's tenure in mid-2005. Um, part of the positioning process includes the development of a strong case statement at the university level and in all of our colleges, uh, an external study to analyze the sentiments of our donors and our friends, and it builds, uh, we need to build some staff capacity to carry out a private fundraising campaign. We don't have a campaign goal yet, but my guess is it will be over $200 million to be raised in five years, beginning with a silent leadership campaign in the fall of 2014. Now, my remarks today uh, have not yet hit upon the theme implied by the uh, title of my remarks, Restoring the Uni in University, so let me finish there. If you conduct a uh, Google search on the web, you're going to find that institutions as significant as uh, the Ohio State University, with or without Gordon Gee, uh, and Johns Hopkins have been working on the theme of one university to break down the highly specialized academic silos that many external observers see characterizes higher education. As one WAG once observed, the world has problems, the universities have departments. Well, at UNC Charlotte, au contraire, we have long understood that the integrated whole is greater than the sum of our parts. We've had a long tradition of working across disciplinary boundaries to serve the needs of the region and the state with a applied re a research of relevance and importance. Many of our undergraduate and graduate programs, and certainly the overall disposition of this faculty, reflects this understanding. In fact, as UNC Charlotte's provost 20 years ago, I endorsed a broad interdis interdisciplinary program in applied and professional ethics that operates to this day. And our current initiatives in EPIC and in data science and in healthcare uh, are good examples of our broad commitment to interdisciplinary work. I think we now need to take this spirit into our administration and how we relate to our internal and external constituents, but especially to our students and our parents. Every action that we take, from a division to a college to a department down to an individual in, uh, employee, reflects on the whole. And when a student or their parents get a problem passed from one administrative department to the next, that can color their view of UNC Charlotte, and the color it is not good. These negative views may be shared with others, and it certainly makes it hard to build a positive relationship with that student who will become a future alumnus. So just as our administrative pr principles here guide us to be collaborative, consultative, transparent, and give close attention to effective execution, we must now work to restore the unit in university. And we all shame the, bla the blame for a bad experience, but we should also all share when we get it right. So as we approach our administrative work this year and think about all these processes and procedures we have in place to manage this growing institution, I hope we'll take this to heart. And, and, and we all know what this looks like. We deal with uh, retailers. We deal with healthcare providers who charge us for services. We deal with customer service agents at banks and the like, we know that when we talk to those persons, we expect them to solve our problem. We ought to have the same attitude here when we're approached with problems from our students and our staff. We also need to reflect the uh, unit in university in terms of our institutional thinking to the outside world. 
we've made tremendous progress on through this uh, in terms of our web redesign process. And I can certainly appreciate the pride that individual colleges, departments, and programs have. Uh, but we just have a dizzying array of online and hard copy uh, publications, logos, sub-brand messaging, and the like. And uh, I think we need, we have something like 30 individual employees across the campus who work on external communications. We need to bring those folks together and think about the messages we're sending to the outside world uh, because quite honestly, it's very easily to over, uh, um, overload the outside world with the number and the diver diverging messages we often want to convey. And then finally, we've got to have uh, some uh, uh, unification in the way in which we approach uh, our infrastructure, Jones already talked about the planning effort in information technology. Uh, I'm going to say that the same is going to be true for a lot of different aspects of our uh, administration. Uh, I heard it said recently that a change in higher education comes one funeral at a time. Uh, I'm not volunteering. Uh, but I hope we will all pull together, even though that uh, in an effort to become a more co coherent university, we have to sacrifice some at the margins. Acting as a single institution is going to be very important as we undertake this unique uh, journey that is called football. Uh, the addition of football brings so many changes and complexities to the university. It adds as a new level of complexity beyond anything we've ever dealt with before. These are particularly felt on home game uh, days on Saturdays in the, in the fall semester, but with our rise to Conference USA in the fall of 2015, we could very well see ourselves being asked to sponsor a game on a Thursday evening uh, to accommodate football scheduling and national television. So it, prevents us, it presents us with uh, scheduling conflicts of all kinds. We have lots of high-value events that occur on Saturdays and during the week, obviously classes. Um, <laughs> laboratories, uh, student recruitment sessions, academic and non-academic conferences, speaker events, various cultural events, and of course special events like international football, excuse me, international festival. <laughs> Woo! Wow, sorry Joel. Um, for that reason we're going to move this uh, year forward with the uh, work and the recommendations of the Integrated Scheduling uh, Task Force that was led by our chief of staff, Kristen Newkirk, and we're gonna do very, our very best to accommodate as many conflicting interests as we can. And we'll make necessary adjustments. We'll learn from what happens. But in the end, the decision to have football was a university decision. And we're all gonna to need to make it work together. Uh, in, the, in the words of the task force that Krista chaired, let's keep calm and play some football. Now finally, let me close with something I hope you might find mod modestly inspirational uh, amid the body of challenging work that Joan and I have laid forth for you this morning. Uh, I've always felt that my college education meant a great deal to me. My parents never had the opportunity to go to college, uh, although both of them wanted to. My father was a uh, returning veteran after World War II. He had a GI Bill, but he, he and my mom also had my older brother in 1945 when my dad was stationed in the Pacific. So both my brother and I were encouraged to go to college, and funny enough, both of us received doctoral degrees. And over the years, perhaps I've taken that for granted that we were first-generation college students, and that might seem surprising because I often tell external audiences that UNC Charlotte has a major educational challenge because a full third of our students are first-generation college students and they don't often have role models at home to help them along. I was lucky. I had a mother with a bullwhip. But <laughs> I was recently reminded about the enduring value of a college degree for so many students when I heard a young woman, Alicia Page of Earl, North Carolina, as she addressed the Board of Governors at their last meeting in Chapel Hill. Alicia is a 2013 graduate of Western Carolina University with a degree in English, and she served Western Carolina as its student body president, and she now serves as UNC President uh, Tom Ross's uh, presidential intern, one of three he has appointed. And Alicia got up in front of a room full of people, and she first observed that she had earned a bachelor's degree in English, and she had a job. <laughs> then she said something even more important. She said, I feel about public higher education 
the way most of you feel about gravity. I tried it, and it works. <laughs> so I was inspired by that. And I thank you for your time this morning. Thank you very much.